Hey friends, welcome back to Well Oiled Operations. Today I am interviewing the past COO of StoryBrand. You might've heard that or know that's Donald Miller's company. Um, we are interviewing Tim Scherer and he, oh my goodness, wait till you, like his energy is so good. I could have just sat and talked with him all day long. He is somebody who started, I think he said he started with Don right in the beginning and they have, has been there for over 10 years, helping build story brand and business made simple. And now he is starting his own. He actually wrote his book, The Secret Society of Success. And he has, uh, is the host of Build a Winning Team podcast. So Tim and I got along very well. And what I loved about it is, he is like the right hand, right? He is COO or he was. So we got to kind of talk a little bit about like what that looks like and just from his angle and his like perspective. So really fun conversation. I definitely recommend checking out his book. Uh, so let's get into today's episode. Hi, Tim. Welcome to Well Oiled Operations. Hey, thanks for having me. Yes, I'm so excited to chat today. Before we dive in, I would love to kind of just kick off with how you got into this world. Like what has been your journey? I know there's just like so much to share. So I would love to hear from you first. Totally. Well, it's crazy because I, I wrote this book that came out about a year ago and never imagined that I would be launching out to do that because mm -hmm. for the past 10 years, i have been working as the COO under Donald Miller. So yeah. We had a company called Story Brand and then launched another brand uh, as well called Business Made Simple. And so I feel like I really grew in my career working mm -hmm. alongside him. And it was yeah. amazing to me because I feel like for a lot of people, they say that to be successful, you have to kind of be the CEO or be yeah. that person in the spotlight. But I actually found so much satisfaction and fulfillment being the right hand, mm -hmm. being the ops guy. Oh, I love um, it. To somebody else. And yeah. so we have so much that we can we talk about. We have so about. much to cover because <laughs> a lot of my people that listen to the show, like, or a lot of my clients, I always say, like, bring your team, have your team listen. This is going to be such a good episode for their team to listen in because not everybody has to be the entrepreneur. Like, and you have, you have the option, but I love hearing you say like, I loved it as, you know, being there. Yes. So how did you get that gig? How did you get that job? So at the time, before I started working with Don, I was actually full-time working at Apple. Okay. Um, but I, I was, I was at Apple for three years, loved it. But I just kind of felt a stirring of like, I just feel like there's something else. Okay. Um, I was married and, 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 and I just started to see as we were starting to think about wanting a family, working the retail life just was mm -hmm. challenging. I mean, your yeah. nights and weekends and I'm working when my friends are off and that just started to not Hard. be perfect for me. And so I was open to some opportunities and uh, happened to, while I was working at Apple, I was managing another musician and an author kind of as a side hustle thinking, okay, maybe I can spin this up yeah. to, you know, leave Apple and do this full time. And then, uh, the, one of the authors that I was working with spoke at an event that Don hosted at one of his uh -huh. conferences. So I was interacting with Don and his team, uh, come to find out Don had a key person on his team that was transitioning out. She, had boys that were about to enter high school. And she's like, I need to be home with them. And they had been looking for like six months to try to find mm. a replacement for this person. Wow. And then they meet me and uh, they both after the conference were like, I know we've been looking for somebody, but you know, I think I've got somebody. And, mm. and they both said that I somehow, you know, was That's this funny. person that kind of had popped on. What the was radar. the role? So, was, was it in operations or was that a promotion at some point? What did well, you start as? So at the time, Don had an assistant mm. and had had an assistant for eight and a half years, but he was writing books, speaking, yeah. kind of a traditional author world. But he used this transition as an opportunity to say, you know, I actually really want to start a company. I want to mm. find somebody that can kind of take that perspective. And I feel like my, I, I don't know what my actual title was director or something, okay. but yeah. I, I kind of stepped into that. And it was at the time it was he and I, um, but then over the last 10 years, 
everybody that got hired got hired under me and I okay. was essentially just you just you know, yeah, I, I started managing and, and running the team and so yeah. it was crazy because we grew that thing from like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to sixteen and a half million and wow so you were along there's a for lot the of change oh yeah. yeah I talk about a journey Dude, okay I mean, here's what I want to ask you they always yeah. say like you know what got you here won't get you there. Sometimes it's who yeah. got you here. Well, like they won't get you yeah, there yeah. for you to stay with that massive change. I want to hear like, what did it take to become like you stepping in when they're at 250,000 versus the, who you yeah, It's a two person company. I yeah. Mean, right? it's, yeah. <laughs> so I want to hear like, like, how did you like, e like challenge yourself? And when Don starts mm -hmm. saying these crazy big numbers, what were you thinking and were you excited? It did it intimidate you, all the things? Well, I, I fortunately, I think it was just baby steps because what I had to know 10 years in is very different from what I needed to know in the moment. So mm -hmm. what I have always felt um, that I could do really well is sit alongside somebody, how to be a part of the, you know, the dreaming, the discerning, mm -hmm. the ideas. But then after we lock into the idea to go and chase it down, yeah, be a part of bringing the team together to go help execute. I don't know if you've taken Patrick Clincioni's working genius assessment. I have, yeah. But it's so interesting for yeah. people who aren't aware of it. Yeah, you know, I interviewed about, him and we talked about it on the show. Oh, it's okay. So everybody needs to go back and listen yes. to that episode because he's amazing. But, but what I found is that there are people who are really great with that, that ideation, the discerning, the idea, and then you kind of have to put it into action. And, and I felt like that's really where I took the baton and stepped in. So it, it's a very different reality in the yeah. journey to go from, yeah, what I had to know that, you know, early yeah. on and what I had to know later. But the, I think the most important thing is I was willing to learn and do whatever it took. Yeah. Um, and I love that part of it, me growing and developing and that, that, that was the fun for me. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't really feel like work. It just felt like one step at a time, you sometimes learn through challenge and holy smokes, yeah. we don't know what we're doing. We need to go figure this out. Yeah. And I, and I love what Daniel X says. He's the uh, CEO of Spotify. He said, the value of a business is the sum of all problems solved. Ugh. That is and such I a good I love quote. solving problems. Mm -hmm. And I learned through solving those problems. And I feel like did that times a million for 10 years. Mm, so good, Tim. Okay, so your book, The Secret Society of Success. So what made you decide like, maybe I should do this? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I was, I my life had been so impacted by authors. Yeah. Yeah. And so then getting to work alongside one and get to see that at a whole other level was just interesting. Mm. And so there's a guy named Bob Goff that's a friend of ours. And um, Bob actually hosted this event called Dream Big. And at the end of this two-day workshop, everyone went around. There's like 30 or 40 of us in the room and everyone said what their big dream was. And this is probably six years ago now, mm. but I said out loud for the very first time, I want to write a book. Mm. And at the time, it was just a fun idea. I wanted yeah. to, like I, I just talked about, I love to learn. I was interested in this. And I just thought I would love to figure out what it would take to write a book. So then as you start down that journey, okay, what book would I want to write? What do I feel like I have the ability to contribute to? You know, Don talks about when you're writing a book, like you have to be willing to be obsessed on one idea for like two years. Yeah. Well, for me, it was like five years, but I, I definitely. Takes even more willpower. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I was kind of doing it as a, uh, just okay. like a passion project, but I had this full-time job. So I, yeah, I was, of course. You know, nights and weekends. And honestly, when I was able to get to it um, and that, that's kind of how the, the journey started, at least. Oh, so good. So how have you defined success? Like, what does yeah. that look for you over the years or today? Yeah, well, there is a time in my life when I wanted to be the next John Mayer. Mm, I, I, okay. I was going to be the guy <laughs> up on stage. I wish you, would, you could have been uh, able to see my hair at that point. <laughs> I mean, it was rocking. Uh, I'll save you that story. But, you know, that in that season, 
and this is my early 20s, I feel like I define success by same definitions that a lot of people do in mm -hmm. culture, fame, money, power, getting into the spot, uh, getting into the, the, the spotlight. Yeah. But you know, I feel like what's happened as I stepped into this role with Dawn and learned all the things that I have been learning is the people that I've been really inspired by, the more I learn about them, the more I really study them and see how they live, they don't seem to define success that way. Mm, interesting. And so it's this group of people that I have, you know, come to call the secret society of success who have shown me a new way to live and a new way to define success that isn't kind of the traditional definitions of fame, money, and power. Yeah. So what does it look like? What are yeah. some of the things that? Yeah. So, she... you know, if, if there is a common denominator for what it looks like to be in the secret society, it, I think it's this idea of helping others win. Mm. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite stories is, you know, LeBron James and the Los Angeles Lakers, they won the NBA finals in 2020. And, you know, knowing a lot about basketball or not, it doesn't really matter. But, you know, for people who um, play in the NBA, you, you would think that they would want to be the scoring leader, you know, the person who had the highest points per game average. And it's a huge deal in the NBA to be the scoring leader. Michael Jordan was that 10 out of the 12 years that he played. But what I think is interesting is in 2020, LeBron didn't win the scoring leader title. And, and in fact, he wasn't even in the top five. But in 2020, LeBron led the league in assists. Mm. So the way that he chose yeah. to play and ultimately how he and his team won was by him setting other people up to score. How perfect is that for yeah. ops people, right? It's like, yeah. what if success is in the assist? What if success is not having to be the entrepreneur? Mm. What if the way that you define success in your role was by setting somebody else up to win? What if that? is success. So good. Somebody has to do it, right? It's like, there's, it doesn't work just having everybody be just the one role. Like you've got to have the strengths, the weaknesses, like everything has to go. And what, what maybe you don't love to do somebody else does. And that's the part I think we forget. We're like, but I don't want to do this, or I hate doing this. Who's going to want to do it? You know, there's somebody that would love that role. There's somebody that would love to take that specific thing off your plate. Yeah. And I, I think that this is really important as well. I am not trying to say in any way that the, the, the problem is the spotlight. Yeah. Or being the CEO. Yeah, yeah. Actually, today I have a CEO title. And so yeah. I feel like we need to talk about this because the problem is not the spotlight. The problem yeah. is not, not the title. The problem that I have is when people come and try to say that that is the only one role that matters, or that mm. should be everyone's aspiration. Right. It should not. And actually, we can talk about this in a second, <laughs> kind of my, my yeah. role, because I feel like it's two kind yeah. of different ideas. But But I think that I have found so much of that enjoyment in my life by serving somebody else and being somebody very you know, under the radar and behind yeah. the scenes. So if you think about a concert, right, you need the person standing in the center of the stage for the whole thing to work. Mm -hmm. But you also need the person running sound, the backing band, the person taking the tickets. Yeah. Every role matters. And I think that the more that we can actually see that, not only in how we show up within our businesses, but also just validation to step into the role that you have mm. um, that is I think where people really can kind of have an unlocking moment for themselves when yeah. they realize like maybe I'm in in the perfect place exactly where I need to be today yeah they're all equally as important like they have they all have to happen for success and that could even be in your personal life right maybe you're doing a working role and your spouse is picking up the kids from school or whatever it is, right? Like, oh my gosh, it yeah. all has to happen. We're a team. We all it's, they're all equally as important. Yeah. And I think it's so powerful to remember that. So um, a lot of people have heard the story of Apollo 11, you know, Neil Armstrong, mm -hmm. Buzz Aldrin, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 
But a lot of people don't know that there's a third astronaut on that mission. And his name was Michael Collins. Michael was the one that Ubered Neil and Buzz to the moon. Mm. So he gets them all the way there, drops them off. Then those two guys do all the things they have to do on the moon's surface. He gets all the way to the moon, but does not ever get out of the command module. He stays in the command module, orbits the moon something like 26 times until those guys are ready to be picked up and brought back to Earth. But what I love so much about this story is that when Michael gets back to Earth and sits down with the press, he talks about how content he was to have had one of those three seats. Mm. So the question that I have for so many people is, do you have to walk on the moon to be happy? Mm. Or can you find contentment in whatever seat that you may find yourself sitting in? Mm -hmm. Because I think that for a lot of people, they're, they're, they're like restless. They're struggling with like a lack of content in their own life. And what I think is pretty interesting for most people is what if this idea of satisfaction is actually, what if you're right there? You just need mm -hmm. a change in mindset. You just need oh, to yeah. look at your life a little bit differently. And maybe you're achieving all of the success that you ever could have imagined exactly where you are today. Contentment in the seat that you're in right now. Yeah. I mean, my listeners for sure are already there, but because we just always want more, right? We don't see it sometimes. So I know people listening, a lot of people listening aren't even the guy, they're not, they're not the guy in the, like the spaceship or the space shuttle. They're, they're the guy that actually is on the moon, but they're mm -hmm. still not content because they want more. So just hearing the message of like, we need to be content with where we're at and what we're doing, I think is so powerful. I know it was a little of a tangent of where you were going, but everybody listening needs to hear that yeah. because we're all, even somebody who like with you going to the COO role, you have so much drive. There was so much in you that wanted to continue to keep going. And I think we all are so driven, but sometimes the driven piece of us, we don't acknowledge how far we've come. And that is yeah. so important. Yeah. And, and I think too, me even just saying to be content where you are, you know, I know that whenever we look to our left and our right. We're going to see somebody yeah. who has more employees. We're going to see somebody who has higher revenue. So it can be very easy to latch onto that drive and that ambition. I am not trying to say in any way that that is a bad thing. Yeah. You know, think about Michael Collins for a second. For him to, to even be chosen to go to the moon meant he was one of three mm -hmm. people. Like he was Huge. best in class. So you can still be in a position of influence, be in a position of power like that, and take on this kind of identity as somebody in the secret society. Because living in the way the secret society has less to do with the amount of visibility you have in your role mm -hmm. or even your place on the org chart. It has far more to do with how you show up. And yeah. so, you know, LeBron James couldn't be more in the spotlight, but I feel like what he does is... He leverages that as an opportunity to help others. And he does that in basketball, but also um, in November, I actually went to Akron, Ohio and went to his I Promise School, which is mm -hmm. uh, a school that he helped build in the, the, the uh, city of Akron public school system. And they're providing um, education for students that may have actually slipped through the cracks. Wow. And they're trying to help these underperforming students get back on track so that they can graduate from high school. And if they graduate from high school, they've actually set it up to where they can get free college tuition at a couple of schools that they have partnerships with. So LeBron is actually using his platform, his influence mm -hmm. to help others win, to serve others and think about others. And whether it's with your team or even with your customers, I feel like people who are in leadership positions that kind of approach life that way are just on a better path. Mm, yeah. I love that so much. So let's talk about recognition of team members mm -hmm. and how that plays into success. Oh, okay. So um, I, we, we were able to interview Dan and Chip Heath on the story brand podcast several years ago. And Dan was 
talking about his book, The Power of Moments, mm -hmm. and an example that he gives. So they went and asked leaders, okay, do you frequently recognize your direct reports for the work that they do? 80% of these leaders said, yeah, we do that. And then <laughs> I know exactly what you're going to say. <laughs> they interviewed the direct reports. And shocker, uh, like only 20% no. <laughs> of them said that they actually yeah. felt that they were frequently recognized for yeah. the work. So they called that the recognition <laughs> gap. Okay. Mm -hmm. So most leaders, it it's they they don't struggle with this because they're bad human beings. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're just busy got a lot going on it's just another thing to be thinking about um but but i know that actually recognition couldn't be more important and and i learned this lesson from a guy named david novak and david is the former ceo of yum brand so kfc taco bell pizza Hut. Okay. and you know david actually grew that business from four billion to 32 billion dollars wow and people are like, holy smokes, how did you do it? Well, how he did it was by creating a culture of recognition where everyone felt that they counted, where mm. they felt like they mattered. And so he knows as a leader, you cast a shadow. People do what the leader does. And so David wanted recognition to be the number one behavior that he drove in the organization. And so what he knew he needed to do was lead the way. Mm. And so he would see somebody uh, out in a restaurant as he was visiting, or even in the corporate office. And he wanted to kind of catch somebody doing things that he knew would drive results in the business. And mm. he would recognize them and um, would give them an award. And then he'd say, hey, I want to take a picture with you. Uh, I'll send you a copy of this picture, but I'll take my copy and I'm going to put it on the walls of my office. Because when people walk into the CEO's office, I want them to see that you're the kind of person who's making stuff happen around here. Wow. So he filled the wall so much so that they actually started putting pictures on the ceiling. Wow. And David says, you know, in, in kind of uh, trying to combat this idea that a lot of leaders might have in this, this realm that would say recognition, you know, stuff like that. It's the soft stuff. Like, does that actually do anything? But David said, it's the soft stuff that drives hard results. Mm. And so recognition, valuing every person's contribution couldn't be more important, especially as you think about driving results in your business. Yeah. And what's funny is we just want the results. So we're like, don't have time for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Too busy. That just, that sounds silly. She, you know, she should yeah, know she's yeah. good. Like, why do I have to say it? Right. Yeah. But if we really, I mean, everybody wants to feel good. Everybody wants to feel recognized. Like they want to feel like knowledge. So I think it's really interesting to hear the CEO said, yes, I'm recognizing them, but oh, the yeah. other person did not feel it. So somebody listening is thinking, oh, I'm pretty good at that. Okay. We probably are nowhere near as good as we need to be because it's a lot of it's just not our personality. Yeah. And, and I actually don't think that you can do it enough uh, because yeah. I think that there is a certain personality that may not need it as often. Mm, um, yeah, agreed. But that's often the person at the top. And so yeah. everyone wants to know, am I doing a good job? Always. Do you think that I'm doing a good job? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the only moment that anyone gets feedback throughout the year is at the end of you know year performance review. Like what a horrible experience that is for them, that that's the only time they got real feedback. Yeah. Um, and, and I just, feel and even like, that, I think a lot of people are busy and they might not even do the review or they do the review and they do it really fast because it's like, oh, shoot, I have to do other reviews this week. So they're not yeah. even that great at the time sometimes. Yeah. And so what's amazing is, um, so after I transitioned out of story brand, which I, I knew as I was about to come up to the release of my book, for me to do that well okay. and launch that book well, um, it was just going to be impossible to do that and keep okay. doing you know, my job. And so I took a leap. I mean, I left a dream job to chase a new dream. Yeah. Um, and so after I um, started in this whole kind of author speaker world, uh, I started working with David Novak actually as a consultant okay. on his podcast. Um, and then this summer, he said, hey, would you be willing to be the CEO of David Novak Leadership, which is 
a nonprofit that he started after he left Yum. And the whole mission is make the world a better place by developing better leaders. Okay. And like, it's his way of giving back. And I, I, I immediately was like, absolutely. I mean, whatever, I, if I can learn from yeah. you and spend time with you, I am all in. But, but, but I bring that up because I work with David now. Mm. Every single day we're talking. This isn't just a thing that he talks about. Like, he does this for yeah. me all the time, mm. just sending me encouraging texts or notes. And like, so you experience I soak it. this stuff up like yeah. crazy. And, and maybe, you know, I know that everyone's got their own, you know, you call it love language or whatever, yeah. but like words of affirmation, that's a pretty big deal for me. Um, and so I just, I know how much it means to me. And so even as I've stepped into, you know, leadership positions over the years, whether I was at, at story brand or now, mm -hmm. you know, doing what I'm doing. I, I really, I love recognition. I love yeah. just calling out the things that other people might have allowed to go kind of unnoticed. I, yeah, I try I to call that. that stuff out. So leaving COO, what kind of transition was that? How long does it take to say, let's get this person to come <laughs> in now and let me teach them everything I've learned in 10 years. Like oh what did gosh. that look like? So it was three months that was okay. kind of from, from making the decision to, you know, my final day was three months. Yeah. Um, it's impossible to try I, to download right? it all. Yeah. You, yeah. You're just, and, and also too, I had so much institutional knowledge that there is just going to be a level of like, fortunately, there's a bunch of other people at the company Absolutely. that have been there for a really long time. So they were going to be able to continue tapping into Step that. In. You do the best that you can, putting together playbooks, having conversations, shadowing, you know, trying to download as much of that information as I could. Mm -hmm. But from that moment, uh, we I think it was probably another month to six weeks, we started hiring for some of the roles and we yeah, split yeah. it up into a couple different. Okay, that's uh, really yeah. interesting to hear. It wasn't like they hired one person to replace you. They hired a few people. <laughs> Which is, I mean, I laugh, but I always joke, like if any, if they had to replace me here, I'm like at least four full-time people, at least like there's no way. <laughs> it feels way. really good to say that. Right? It's like, y'all are going to be so screwed. <laughs> you know. uh, but, but I think that uh, what I, what, what we used it as is an opportunity. Yeah. Anytime roles would come in or come out at StoryBrand, we would always say, what does this make possible? Mm. Um, and we had to say the exact same thing. So, so here is a truth in any business. Yeah. And the truth is that everyone is replaceable mm. and no one is replaceable. Mm. So no one is replaceable. Something will change by this person exiting the company and yet the company will continue on. Yeah. Steve Jobs dies. Yeah. The company keeps going. Yeah. Even someone as influential as him. So I cannot be proud and say like oh the whole company shut down it's like hey guys i'm not gonna show up anymore and the company's gonna keep rolling so like yeah, yeah. a little bit of humble pie here <laughs> just get the next person ready because next yeah, one's yeah. coming you know mm -hmm. so i think that what i tried to do is mm -hmm. i felt really fortunate that we had such a long time to be able to uh leave well because that's exactly yeah. what i wanted and i want them to win I yes, still want them to win. That's, yes. I, I mean, just this week, I was talking to one of the people on that team, you know, the president of the company. Now I was yeah. talking with him. So I, I wanted to set them up to win and I, you know, yeah. definitely still want them to win. Well, and it's not even about what you did the three months you were leave, transitioning to leave. It's what you had done up until that time. So mm -hmm. I think for people that are listening like, I think there could be a fear of like, oh my goodness, I can't even imagine if my right hand of 10 years all of a sudden left, but when they're doing their job well, they are, like you already said, everybody was already coming in through you, coming or under you. Like yeah. you were building the systems, you were building the team. Like, it's not just like you were the asset, you built lots of assets that are still yeah. there. Yeah, totally. And and I feel like if I could do something as almost like an onboarding process, I almost want to say to everyone, like read, anyone coming in story brand, it's like, hey, read the Secret Society of Success because- this is actually a foundation for how we built that company and the culture. Mm. And it was valuing every person on the team, yeah. kind of going from me to we. I mean, a lot of these ideas is how we shaped that company. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think that it really is is meaningful to know that um, that foundation was built over time. You know, yeah. you're right that that didn't happen in a in a minute. Right. Because I think I think people can hear that and think like, oh, I don't know what I would do with just three months. It's like, no, no, no. You had been building it this whole time for it to continue to run. So here's something that I learned from a friend, which I think is a really interesting yeah. idea. I've never done this, but along those lines, I think it is scary if only one person in your organization knows a bit of information. Yeah. So there is this idea of, you know, building those contingency plans, playbooks, whatever operating procedures, it's, it's important to get those things written down. Yeah. Um, but, but the thing that I was going to say is I had a friend who he was doing month long sabbaticals for members of his team Mm, to pressure test the business. I heard this too. And I love it. This isn't a burnout tactic or a preventing burnout tactic. This is truly a like operations. Can we survive without this person? And yeah. what are we going to need to know that mm-hmm. we might not have known until they're gone? So let's that, not wait. Yeah. Let's do it now. I, okay, I love so that. This, I think that is so powerful. We actually had our, one of our, uh, somebody on our team, on our social media team, she was getting married and immediately going on her honeymoon and was requesting two weeks off. And we're like- And you said no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted, I was like, this is not acceptable. Okay. You cannot leave and go to Hawaii. Before, okay. So look, I want you to have fun, but this ain't happening. But just check in on Instagram every so yeah. often. Yeah. So we were like, oh, I mean, it was definitely nerve wracking, but we're like, okay. So she had to build everything so well that somebody else yeah, could do it yeah. for two weeks. Yeah. But having that happen was like, now we have that asset. Now, yeah. every time she's sick or she takes just a normal vacation, it's like, no problem. She's got everything. Here you go. Here's the playbook. So I agree with you, like forcing that time off to say like, this is our time to get us ready to really understand what it is you do and how you Mm -hmm. do it. Because I think even if you systematize the business, some people still have some systems in their head and we Mm -hmm. don't know and they don't even realize Mm -hmm. until we need it. I'm the worst at this. Let me just come clean. And here's why. I had my teams create playbooks. I never created a playbook. Yours. Okay, interesting. And I mean, I, I feel like I did it Like orally. the right hand spilling the secrets. This is good for yeah, everybody to know. It's just like, it, and here's why. It's so hard to do because mm. I'm like, I'm so busy. I don't have time to write these playbooks. And then that's just me not being a good teammate. And, and like, <laughs> even like handing off all these playbooks. So I feel like- yeah. The majority of that for me was done like one to one, writing down some processes that really mattered. But like, I I still need to do some of that myself yeah. for some parts of the business I'm in today. So absolutely, it's so it's so hard to do. So give yeah. yourself some grace as well. Like these are all really good ideas. Um, in theory, and sometimes you're like, <laughs> it's like hard, hard, like easier said than done. For absolutely, sure, and for sure. <laughs> it is a work in progress. Like it, yeah. you're always going to have to do like a little bit at a time. All right, Tim, this has been so fun. I knew I was excited to see your name in here. I'm like, oh, this is gonna be such a good conversation. Where can we find your book? Where can we find more about you? Please share. Yeah, so secretsocietybook.com is probably the easiest way. And and for everyone listening, I'm assuming that podcast listeners sometimes are audiobook listeners. So mm-hmm. I actually narrated the audiobook, oh, good. which I had so much fun doing. Yeah. Um, so I'll read it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So yeah, definitely go grab the book. I'm excited to dig into it. I feel like there's like so many good pieces. You've already kind of like started to tease a little bit that I'm like, oh, I, I need to hear the rest. So yeah. thank you for being here. Congrats on all of your success. Like how fun, uh, but go grab Tim's book again. Tim, thanks for your time. Hey, thanks for having me. I loved it.